Hi, and welcome back to Interestivity. I'm Isaac, your host for today's interesting history session, and we're back again with the Third Reich. Now, before you watch this episode, I recommend you take a look at our last video on this subject, where we talk all about the events leading up to the situation Germany found itself in in the beginning of March 1945, because that's where our video today will be starting off from. We'll be talking about a bunch of completely non-depressing topics today, such as mass suicides, war, and the fanaticism that permeated the Third Reich in its final struggle for existence. So just sit back and um, enjoy, I guess. So as you probably know, things were not looking good for Hitler's Germany by March 1945. The German Wehrmacht had been driven back far beyond its pre-war borders and was now fighting on home soil. The Luftwaffe, due to lack of experienced pilots and fuel, had ceased to be a mass fighting force, and economically speaking, the German war production was only a shadow of that of what it had been just a year earlier. With Soviet and Allied front lines now deep in ethnic German territory, and Allied civilian targeted bombing raids reaching their peak, it is estimated that roughly over 16 million refugees were fleeing further and further into the heart of Germany. Despite this, one still has to take into account that even though things were looking very bleak for the Third Reich in the final stages of the war, the Nazi government, while often inflicted by internal strife, still continued to execute its functions and remained in draconian control over large parts of Central Europe up until its unconditional surrender on the 8th of May 1945. So first, let's take a peek at Germany's military situation in early March 1945. In the course of January and February alone, the German Wehrmacht had lost more than 700,000 men. In comparison, that's more than twice the amount of casualties suffered in the Battle of Stalingrad, the bloodiest battle of World War II. These casualties of early 1945 severely encumbered the German army's fighting force, mainly since these were soldiers that due to Germany's precarious manpower situation could not be replaced. The men that were used to equalize the high amount of casualties taken in these months were primarily inexperienced young boys and old men. Indeed, soldiers drafted into the German military after 1944 had a worse chance of surviving and made up a larger percentage of the total German military death count than those drafted in 1939. Furthermore, these soldiers drafted in 1944 or later only had a life expectancy of 0.8 years once being drafted to that of 4.2 years for soldiers drafted in 1939. This manpower problem was accompanied by a major industrial predicament as well. The Soviet Vistula Offensive in January had captured the second largest German industrial area in Upper Silesia, and the Ruhrgebiet in Western Germany, the Third Reich's primary region of industry, was also experiencing serious production difficulties due to close proximity to the front, incessant allied bombings, destroyed infrastructure, and a lack of resources. These two factors played a large role in inhibiting the Wehrmacht's offensive capabilities in the spring of 1945. Yet by the beginning of March, the German army still possessed two relatively coherent front lines along two natural barriers, the Rhine River in the west and the Uda Neisse River in the east. In the west, Allied troops in the aftermath of the failed German Ardennes offensive had been able to push from the Belgian border all the way to the banks of the Rhine River and were now dangerously close to crossing into central Germany. At this point, Hitler and many German generals acknowledged the fact that once the Allies had crossed the Rhine, it would be impossible to put up any structured military resistance in the West. Thus, massive efforts were undertaken to destroy all bridges crossing the Rhine. And for the most part, things were looking relatively good, with only four bridges left by the beginning of March. Three of these bridges, at Cologne, Bonn, and Uemitz, were still managed to be destroyed before the Allied offensive had reached them. Yet one bridge at Remagen was still captured by American forces on the afternoon of March 7th, 1945. Naturally, Hitler was furious once hearing the news, and immediately demanded counterattacks in order to prevent the Americans from establishing a bridgehead in the region. Additionally, the last remainders of the Luftwaffe were summoned in the attempt to bomb the bridge and thus catch the American troops on the eastern bank of the river in a pocket. This even went as far as Hitler ordering V2 rockets, his inaccurate wonder weapons, which were normally designed for civilian targets, to be fired at the bridge from bases over 200 kilometers away in the northern Netherlands. While the bridge eventually did collapse, by then the Americans had already found other means of crossing the river and had established a large enough bridgehead to sustain themselves there. Thus the way into the heart of Germany in the west was finally open. At the same time American troops from the Remagen bridgehead began pushing east, British troops crossed the Rhine just north of the Ruhr area near the Dutch border in a costly maneuver named Operation Plunder. These two allied spearheads to the north and south severely put the German army Heerschruppe B under General Model, located in the Ruhr region, coincidentally also the largest remaining German army in the west with around 325,000 men, in danger of being surrounded. 
While German efforts were made to hold the Ruhr area along the Sieg River to the south and the Duisburg area to the north, Kriegsmüdigkeit among troops, a German word to describe being tired of war, led to the Allies easily being able to pocket the entire region. The Allies had in result not only isolated the rest of the Reich from its most important industrial area, it also made Germany's greatest army in the west useless and in effect crippled any hope of mass resistance east of the Rhine. In general, the Allies faced little German opposition east of the Rhine. While there were often incidents of small army groups resisting the Allied assault, especially in the south of Germany, Allied troops often had a good reputation among civilians. Mind you, Allied air raids were still killing roughly 1,000 people a day, but more than often Allied ground troops were welcomed by the local populace, as many saw them as a sign that the harsh days of the last months of the war were now finally over. This is supported by refugee numbers and refugees region of origin as well, as it is evident that only roughly 1.4 million Germans fled from Allied troops in the West, compared to a staggering 8 million in the East. So in a quick recap, while Allied troops did face relatively fierce German resistance when crossing the Rhine, they advanced and spread out relatively quickly once overcoming this natural obstacle. Now let's shift our focus to the Eastern Front, where, needless to say, the situation was looking quite different. As mentioned in our last episode, the Russians had launched an enormous offensive in January, and in a matter of two and a half weeks advanced all the way from the Vistula River in modern day Poland to the Oder River, just 60 kilometers from Berlin. German forces in the East had been strongly neglected in the last half of 1944, with only roughly 20% of newly produced equipment going to units there, as the rest had been needed to launch the Ardennes Offensive in the West. Thus, Soviet forces easily swept through ethnic German lands, driving millions of refugees before them. In the first days of February, the Soviets even managed to establish important bridgeheads on the other side of the Oder River. At this point, historians argue, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin could have easily proceeded to order an attack on Berlin, and in effect could have drastically shortened the war and probably changed history forever, since Soviet forces could have occupied a much larger chunk of Germany as they did in our timeline. Yet Stalin chose to wait in order to secure the logistical situation and to not overspread his troops. In these days in early February 1945, the atmosphere in the capital of the Third Reich was catastrophic. The German civilian population in Berlin, which had shrunk by roughly 2 million to just barely more than half of its pre-war population, now feared the final moments of the Reich had begun. Volkstum units were hastily assembled, and rumors emerged that the Soviets had already dropped parachuters inside the city perimeter. A Spiegel article from 1966 describes that overnight a black market for cars and gas sprang up, paid for with gold, diamonds, coffee, and schnapps. It seemed that the closer the end loomed, the more one could see what items of luxury Berlin still had to offer. But these were not the final moments of the Third Reich. In fact, Berlin would remain under Nazi control for another three months. After these first initial moments of panic, the situation eventually stabilized. Since the Soviets had slowed their offensive, German troops were able to reorganize along the new Oder front and contain the Soviet bridgeheads. Hitler ordered the construction of manned defenses along the Oder and Ice rivers, which were given the name Nibelungstellung, after an old German saga. The Nibelungstellung was the last line of defense in the East, and German leadership and propaganda went long ways to make this clear to Wehrmacht and Volkssturm units stationed there. Hitler himself appealed to the army, stating, You soldiers of the East know what fate awaits German women and children. While the old men and boys are murdered, women and children will be reduced to whores. The rest will be marched to Siberia. News also regularly reported the atrocities committed by Soviet soldiers to create fear among the German population, which could be turned into motivation to keep on fighting. Man kann hier gar nicht von Soldaten und Offizieren in diesem Sinne sprechen. Man kann hier nur sprechen von bestialischen Horden. Not just through propaganda did Hitler and the Nazi leadership keep the German populace fighting. For many, the last months of the war revealed the true horrors of living in a dictatorship nearing its downfall. The term tyranny on the home front is often used to describe the harsh measures and punishments Hitler's regime inflicted on its own citizens in order to prevent the collapse of the Reich. For example, a law from the 15th of February 1945 describes how the severity of the struggle for the Reich's existence necessitates all Germans' full commitment to the cause. Thus, anyone who did not fulfill their duty to the regime was to be instantly court-martialed and executed. Basically, hereby anyone who was suspected of being not fully devoted to the Nazi cause could be killed. In these last months, thousands were accused of deserting the army or collaborating with the enemy. In addition to the brutal punishments inflicted on the German population, the Nazi regime also went long ways to maintain their industry, no matter the casualty count. German factory workers were ordered to continue working despite the threat of imminent air raids, and factories themselves were to continue production even with the front lines just miles away. In spite of all these efforts to keep the German war machine alive, the Third Reich was in a failing state. Even the Nazi regime acknowledged this as a fact. Aber noch niemals standen die Dinge so wie heute auf des Messers Schneide. Musste das deutsche Volk unter so enormen Gefahren sein nacktes Leben verteidigen, 
und das Reich in einer letzten Gewaltanstrengung den Schutz seines bedrohten Gefüges sicherstellen. In this final stage of the conflict, German leadership knew it needed to draw on its most fanatical ideas and elements and instill these in the German populace. One example of the fanaticism present in Nazi leadership is the creation of the organization Werwolf, which had the purpose of fighting a guerrilla war in the occupied parts of Germany. Already in September of 1944, when Allied forces had first crossed the border into Germany, Heinrich Himmler, the leader of this S, had commissioned the founding of this group. And as the war carried on and on, and more and more parts of Germany were occupied, more and more attention was given to the organization by other high-ranking Nazi officials. In principle, this guerrilla movement had two objectives. One was to sabotage and terrorize advancing enemy troops in order to tie down as many soldiers as possible, and the other was to liquidate all citizens of the Reich who were willing to cooperate with the enemy. While the organization itself was only minimally successful, and it effectively ceased to exist after May 1945, it did still have a small effect on the Allies. Indeed, Allied generals such as Dwight Eisenhower of the US Armed Forces were aware of the existence of the werewolves, and were cognizant of the fact that such an organization could pose a serious threat for the future of the Allied forces in an occupied Germany. Thus, the mere existence of a guerrilla organization on paper indirectly proved to be a small success, as Americans did station large amounts of soldiers behind the front lines, which were supposed to keep an eye out for subversive activities. An additional false threat that Allied commanders perceived to exist was the presence of an extensive German National Redoubt, or fallback area, in the Bavarian and Austrian Alps. Commonly also known as the Nazi Alpine Fortress, many elements of Allied leadership assumed that members and loyal followers of the Nazi regime were going to attempt to retreat to the mountain valleys and passes of this geographically advantageous area, in order to hold themselves up there and carry out a protracted final battle. Even though some Allied generals were certain of Nazi efforts to establish a massive defensive facility in the Alps, and entire offensives were carried out in the last days of the war, in order to cut off all traffic and communication between northern Germany and the Alps, the existence of an Alpine fortress largely turned out to be a myth. While it is definitely worth noting that a large part of Nazi leadership fled to the south during the final weeks, and there were voices inside the Reich advocating for last stand in the region around Hitler's vacation home in southeastern Bavaria, once the Fuhrer decided to carry out his final battle in Berlin, the fate of the mythical Alpine fortress was pretty much sealed. Back to the fanaticism of the regime. Besides creating an underground guerrilla organization, German leadership facing an ever more deteriorating situation still had a plan to put the planes they had left to good use. Indeed, Japan wasn't the only Axis power to implement kamikaze-style attacks. Germany did so as well, despite so on a smaller scale. The so-called Leonidas Squadron was a Luftwaffe wing which had the intent of gathering young fanatical volunteers to fly either high-risk missions or self-sacrifice missions. During the final days before the Battle of Berlin, 35 of these total commitment orders were carried out against Soviet-held bridges across the Oder. But just like Organization Werwolf, this Nazi plan too only brought minimal direct success. However, in a way, the idea behind the Leonidas Squadron can be seen as a paradigm of the Nazi leadership's ideology and way of thinking in the final phase of its downfall. The mere idea of giving up one's life for the lost cause of National Socialism was a common notion in these last months of the war. In fact, Germans were even expected to sacrifice themselves for their Fuhrer and Reich. In an article titled Risking One's Own Life, published on April 15th in the second to last edition of his editorial Das Reich, Propaganda Minister Goebbels outlined his own standpoint on dying for the National Socialist regime. Either death by enemy or death by suicide were both seen as viable options in order to escape the so-called yoke of slavery that the German people would supposedly face with the downfall of the Third Reich. Suicide was even seen as an honorable way to end one's life, as a sort of a self-historization, and many Nazi political and military leaders decided to use this method once the fate of the German Reich had been sealed. Roughly 20% of high-ranking Nazi officials committed suicide in the final days of the war. This trend of self-murder even carried over to the regular German population as well, with 242 suicides per 100,000 people in the spring of 1945, a suicide rate five times higher of that than the previous years. Many radical followers of the Nazi state believed that a life beyond that under the National Socialist ideology was not worth living, and that a future in an occupied Germany was unthinkable. As you can probably assume, this was Adolf Hitler's philosophy as well. Already in mid-March of 1945, as the Allies were planning their thrust across the Rhine in the west, and the Soviets had reached the last German defensive barrier in the east at the Oder River, Hitler had declared that if the war is lost, then the German people will also be lost. After all, the German people would have proved the weaker nation, and the future would belong to the strongest nation in the east. What would remain after this fight would be in any event inferior subjects, since all the good ones would have fallen. As you can see, Hitler believed that the German people were indefinitely bound to his Reich, and thus, if there was no Reich, there could be no German people. This way of thinking legitimized one of Hitler's most fateful 
and if it had been implemented, destructive acts of the entire war. The so-called Nero Order, aptly named after the insane Roman Emperor Nero, was supposed to instrument the policy of scorched earth on German soil. Basically, the order demanded the total and complete destruction of Germany, as Hitler was convinced that all industry, infrastructure, and supply centers needed to be eradicated so that one, the enemy couldn't use them, and two, a post-war German society wouldn't be able to use them to its benefit. In a quick conclusion, the further the Reich neared its downfall, the more the German population bore the brunt of its fanatical last breaths. And even though military-wise, the war was all but lost, with Allied forces sweeping across the German heartland and Soviet troops on Berlin's doorstep, there was still one last battle to fight. Thanks for watching Intercity, and we'll see you next time in the midst of the battle for Berlin. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe. You can also drop any future video suggestions in the comments below. I don't know what to say. Goodbye.